And so navigating the relational tensions, the ministerial tensions, the logistical tensions, it could be really painful. And I thought there was something that we got wrong. I didn't realize that God was making space for something new. Faith is a speaker, pastor, church planter, author, and CEO. She holds a Master's of Divinity with a concentration in global studies and has been in ministry for 18 years. Faith is the CEO and founder of the Honor Summit, a nonprofit organization that equips and activates Asian American women for the mission of God. She's also the co-founder and co-pastor of Mosaic Covenant Church in New Jersey, alongside her husband, Pastor David Cho. Well, Faith, welcome. <laughs> so glad to be here. We're doing this. We're doing this. And after reading just the intro, I'm like, I am surprised you're even on this podcast. <laughs> Oh, anything for you, Chris. Anything for you. <laughs> okay. So uh, obviously you're wearing a lot of hats and I yes. want to know how you found yourself in, in just so many different spaces and they seem kind of like diverse and across the board. Right. You know what? When people ask me the formula to all the things that I do, I always say that there was, there was absolutely no formula. Um, and Chris, you know this well because we had this conversation many times, but it's just really living this life of following the lead of the Holy Spirit, you know, and navigating every closed door and every open door. And when the Spirit says, throw a conference, you throw a conference. When the Spirit says, write this paragraph, you write this paragraph and you you put together a blog that nobody reads. And and when when he leads me to these things, it's somehow um on him and his problem in a way to do what he wants to do with those things. And he ended up creating a nonprofit organization, a church, a book for kids. It just kind of happened that way. When I hear it, I realize, oh, wow, that's a lot. But in my experience, it was just saying yes to the Holy Spirit at every season of my life. You know, I'm jumping in because uh, there are people listening to this across the board spectrum of the church and they're mm -hmm. dialing in going, awesome, this is a Propel Women's podcast on leadership and I want five leadership tips. And you've dived in and the first sentence was, well, it's the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now that yeah. for many people is already sending them in a tailspin because they were like ready for <laughs> how did you plan this? How did you strategize this? What are the five principles that you applied in order right. to make this happen? What was your marketing plan? And yet you're saying undergirding everything that you're doing is the leadership yeah. of the Holy Spirit. Do you want to explain that just a little bit? Because for some people that yeah. concept is even going to be a foreign concept. Yeah. It's based on Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And honestly, when the Honor Summit happened, I wasn't envisioning a nonprofit ministry that serves Asian American women. It was just a conference in the beginning. And it was just a yes to that first step. It was just a first step and then the next step. He is a light onto my path, sure, but he's also a lamp onto my feet. And step by step, just following him, him in every turn, every turn of the corner, every step forward, every step back. Um, and so it's not being so married to an ideal future. It's not being married to an ideal product. And there's been times when I would have to pivot and ask myself, man, did I waste my time just because I'm pivoting, just because I'm changing the vision statement again, just because um, we're restructuring and we spent the past two years working on this structure, you know, but it's, it's not being married to a final product, but being more married to the intimacy and the leading of the Holy Spirit, um, step by step and just not being so, um, adherent to my ego along the way, really, because there's going to be times when the steps that he leads you to is mysterious. And you're like, wait, is that right? God, did I waste my time? God. And in the mystery, you have to really forego your ego. You have to forego control. You have to forego what people think of you. Um, and as you do that, he will make you pass straight. You know, Rachel, I'm thinking, and everyone, this is my co-host, Rachel Hunker, who is a legend. Um, yes. <laughs> we were talking about uh, the Honor Summit, and I was thinking, like, what do you want to ask uh, Faith about the practicalities of the Honor Summit? You know, you mentioned you mentioned letting go of an, an ideal, letting go of an end product. And I know like running a conference is no small feat. 
And when you get into those nitty gritty details, you're, you're detail oriented like that because you have an end result in mind. You have something in your head of what this is going to look like. So as you're fleshing out the honor summit and as you're putting that together, how do you let go of the end result? How do you let go of the ideal? Because that's not easy. And it's painful. Yeah. It's, it's really painful because ministry is something where you put your blood, sweat, and tears into. And when things don't work out the way that you thought that was supposed to be it, um, it could be really painful. I remember in 2020, we were supposed to have four conferences around the world. We were supposed to minister to pastors' wives in Indonesia. We were supposed to um, have conferences in the East Coast and the West Coast, inner healing retreats. And it was supposed to be our biggest year yet. And all of it got canceled. All of it. And and not only that, the duress of all those changes. I mean, your team could only handle so much disappointment. You know, you're... And, and when people go through the disappointments in what's going on in the ministries, and they, they could easily also take it out on the leadership, you know? And so navigating the relational tensions, the ministerial tensions, the logistical tensions, it could be really painful. And I thought there was something that we got wrong. I didn't realize that God was making space for something new. Ooh. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that. I You know, in my narrative of, oh, God's mean and God's harsh, I... I got really depressed about it and really down on myself about it. But when I realized that the narrative is truly that God is good right, and he's ever moving and never done. And once that narrative came to play, I realized, wait, this is not a failure. It's an opportunity. And when we went on a sabbatical as a team, um, that was actually what opened the door and made space for fresh vision and to really turn the corner and not just be, um, a women's ministry, but a women's ministry that that enters into the nuanced conversations of equipping and activating Asian American women. Because before that, it was just for women, you know, right. and that was fine, you know, but God wanted us to really hone in on this vision. And we wouldn't have been able to do that, that tough work those and enter into those tough conversations unless we had the space. So what I thought was punishment was actually God doing a new thing. And I wouldn't have been able to recognize it unless I was able to let go of control and the ego and so on. I love that. There's a couple of questions that I'm thinking through that. So tell us first, give us three or four of the nuances that pertain particularly to Asian American women. Yes. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. So in the conversation of Asian American women, the moment I mention Asian American women, even if it's in the church, it's immediately politicized. Right. You know, immediately. I feel people tense up and and just be, oh, this, we're, we're going there. We're having that conversation. When actually we're talking about Asian American women in the context of the church and the context of God's kingdom. But it's difficult to do it in a way when immediately there's a lot of baggage and presumption, right? Um, when people immediately think, oh, this is an academic conversation. This is a, a political conversation. No, this is a kingdom conversation. And this is a matter of God's church. So there's that. Now, the reason why it's nuanced is because um, I think it surprises people that that this is a necessary conversation because when they think of that one Jenny that they know, that one Laura, that one Vicky, they think she's doing great, you know? And without realizing that there's rarely a space where she could be fully and authentically activated and discipled. In right. the multi-ethnic church, quite frequently, she would have to code switch enough and in a way suppress a lot of her... Um, her heritage, her background, her upbringing, in order to be able to fit in well enough to be disciple. In the Asian American immigrant church, oftentimes because of the culture, um, she would have to suppress her fire, her call, her dreams, um, and even the volume of her voice in order to fit in and be activated. And Yes, there's a lot of conversation now, and we're in a blessed time where um, a lot of conversation for Asian Americans are being put out there, but it's also often led by men. And so you have this dichotomy, this tension that Asian American women feel that, wait, my narrative is not the same as 
the Asian American men that are speaking up for me as well, you know? And so in a way, there's this question of, okay, well, where will she be fully activated? Because the Holy Spirit redeems all of us, all of who we are, not just parts of who we are, right? So where does she have the opportunity to be discipled and activated in a way that she could actively participate in God's kingdom work? And when I realized that it's very rare and it's a conversation that's not often had, um, we had to really go against the grain to be able to create that space. Awesome. And are women responding to that? Are you finding that they're jumping in and saying, okay, you are meeting a very real felt need? Oh, absolutely. And it's a felt need that not a lot of women have um, language for. It's one of those things where they don't realize that they need it. And that's why it's difficult, right? That's why it's difficult because not everyone could see it. And building something where not everyone could see, not everyone have language for, and you're kind of starting from ground up. But also there is, this is not to say there's not any language, but oftentimes the language is very academic, right? Um, Which is beautiful and have been helpful up until this point. But for the everyday Asian American woman, Um, that is just wanting to know why she feels disconnected from her father um, in heaven. Like, uh, well, how do we do to reach her? How do we do to meet her where she is at? And oh man, I mean, just last week I was in Canada and um, and I was preaching and there was this woman who brought um, her half Asian American daughter up to me and this girl was crying because she was like, I... I didn't know that it was possible. I didn't know that there was hope for someone like me. I've never seen this. I didn't realize it was something that I needed. And it was such a powerful, powerful moment. And I think for the kingdom, it's necessary. Absolutely. I love that you're saying that. I'm thinking, I'm going back to when the Honest Summit pivoted, but in the midst of that, you had to manage your own disappointment as well as listen to your team's disappointment and continue to envision them. That that dichotomy is where a leader constantly finds themselves. So how do you personally manage your own disappointment while simultaneously pumping everyone with vision about the future? Oh my goodness, it is. Let me just tell you, I don't know if I'll ever fully get used to it. You know, I, I would love to be like, oh, I've been there, done that. But <laughs> it's hard and it's weighty yeah. and it's burdensome because you have people looking to you. Yes. Right. And you're, they, they're looking to you for that direction, for that hope. And sometimes their disappointment can minister to me instead of allowing my hope to minister to them, you know, and their right. and their bitterness that. about what didn't turn out could often set the tone instead of me setting the tone. And I, I, I am a firm believer that a leadership that is kingdom oriented, we need to be the uh, thermostats and not thermometers, Yeah, you know, and to be a thermostat means that I need to be the most hopeful, the most hungry or the hungriest in the room. Right. And hope could look so foolish in the face of disappointment. It really does. But I would say for any leader that is dealing with the weight of a disappointed team, uh, I mean, I cannot tell you, if I were to look back three years ago and look at myself and trying to navigate what was going on, keep that hope going because hope will always win. As long as hope is turned on, it will always win. And you know what? Some people may be like, that hope is just too much of a risk for me. And so I'm out. That's okay. That, that, that's okay. Because those that are um, more that have an affinity to your hope will eventually get on board. The ones that have an affinity to hope over hopelessness will stay, you know, and that will always win. So keep that hope on and have that smile on in those meetings and keep trying to pump them up because eventually that hope will beat the hopelessness. I agree. I'm thinking we're living in a time though where hope is being attacked. It's kind of like if you are hope filled, people are saying, well, you are denying or dismissing reality or, you know, and so for a leader in this hour to not only personally feel hope, but to continue to administer hope, 
I mean, you're almost cancelled for being hope-filled in this yes. day and age in which we live. Yes. And I find that an interesting dynamic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you could have a thousand people that are motivated by, by your hope, but the two negative critical comments are enough to send you on a spiral downstairs. So I agree with you. I think it's something we could bring to the table, but you have got to have a strong internal fortitude to stay yeah. full of hope. I mean, ultimately, of course, I'm grateful that Jesus is this hope we have as an anchor for our soul because we've got yeah. to anchor ourselves to him yeah. because the thing that I have found even in my own leadership in the last four or five years is I am by nature a very faith-filled, hope-filled mm. person, mm. but I am stunned say 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I started in leadership, people were inspired by hope and motivated by hope and wanted hope. And I'm thinking, okay, so I've gone through a couple of generations of uh, leaders and raising up younger generations. And I'm like, whoa, the pushback in the last five years Mm -hmm. um, and almost the sort of accusation that you are in denial of reality and Mm -hmm. yet I'm here. I run a global anti-trafficking organization. There's so much pain, suffering, evil and injustice and yet hope and a deep-rooted joy, that is the essence of the gospel. So to bring that into our leadership, I think takes a lot of courage and tenacity Mm -hmm. and fortitude in this hour. Absolutely. And and this is not going to fit into many leadership manuals, I am sure, but I am a firm believer that that courage has to come from the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It really does. There's something about the anointing of the Holy Spirit that made um, the apostles rejoice after they got flogged, you know, and thankful that they got flogged it cannot come from our natural selves you know i'm naturally a loyalist you know so i want to make my team happy i really really do i want my team to stick with me through the tough times i i want to excite them and have them be excited to be there with me um so to be able to face disappointment to be able to face failure to be able to face closed doors and still be joyful about it and happy that you went through those doors, um, it, it takes something supernatural. It, it really, really does. And that comes from the Holy Spirit. I agree. And I think in our whole leadership journey, hanging on to hope um, against, you know, impossible odds is the yeah. thing that keeps us going forward. I'm thinking I'm three and a half decades in. And yes, you know, we could give 20 principles now and things that we need. But at the end of the day, mm-hmm. I think ultimately people are attracted to hope. People want hope. Who doesn't want hope? And so yeah. I think the darker it gets, the more hope-filled and faith-filled that we need to be in the midst of that. Yes. Now, I'm interested because, you have you know, you've got also four children. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I God bless you in New Jersey raising four <laughs> children. <laughs> That's it. You pastor a church with your husband as well as, you know, you're an author and you run the Honor Summit. Okay, so when you feel an invitation to start a new thing, to take on something else, I'm fascinated to know what your discernment process is. Like when your plate is already full, how are you adding more things to your plate? How do you decide how that's going to happen? I'm a firm believer that if it is something that the Lord has led one to, then even just a nudge from you will go a mile, um, that there will be a grace to be able to build it even with the minimal amount of effort, right? And so I I remember the reason why the Honor Summit even came to be was it was actually birth from a place of burnout, to be honest. Wow. Yes, because after I had my fourth child, I was like, I am done. I'm tired. Yes, I understand yeah, that. Yeah, I it was a lot. And um, I remember telling my husband, hey, I think maybe it's time for me, my ministry to look like supporting you because he's a pastor too. I'm like, that gets just as much points in heaven being a supporting role. Like I'm good. Um, And my husband being my husband was like, maybe you should pray on it. And I remember I spent six months in prayer every week, fasting, opening the doors to the sanctuary of my church, and just spending hours with the Lord. And I remember telling people to fast with me and they'll be like, 
what are we fasting for, pastor? And I'm like, I don't know. Just fast just to be with God. I didn't know we needed an agenda to go to God. That's like saying I need an agenda to be with my husband. It makes no sense, right? But the agenda sometimes is with the Lord, um, is to be with the Lord. And I remember uh, we would do this for about six months every week just fasting and praying, just being with the Lord, just just saying yes to his presence. And I remember after six months, I woke up and I felt the voice of the Lord very clearly. You need to start a women's conference. Wow. And I remember my flesh was so confused because at that time in my life, I didn't even like women's conferences. I didn't get the concept. <laughs> you know, I was like, is it just women telling women you're great? Like, I don't get it. Like, what are we trying to do? But, you know, somehow in those six it. months. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, yes. now I love women's conferences, but, you know, back then I didn't know. But I remember. So but I remember it was those six months where the Lord took away all my nose. And where I just said yes to the mystery of throwing a women's conference. And I remember that first conference, women from seven different states showed up. And wow. we didn't even have like large advertisement or anything. It was just maybe like one feeler video that just went out there to say, hey, we're doing, we're local church girls and here it is. Um, and that was when the Lord introduced me to the harvest for Asian American women. Wow. I didn't realize that it was even needed. I didn't realize how many Asian American women were hungry for that nuanced conversation that was relevant to their everyday lives, that wanted language, that wanted hope. And so that was birthed from just being with the presence of God. He helped me discern that. And when people ask, what was your, um, what was in your thought process of starting a nonprofit ministry? I, and to that, I'm like, I didn't know I was starting one until I was starting one. You know, it was just saying yes to the presence of the Lord. Faith, as you're sharing that and you're talking about, you know, this idea of like it being, it being birthed from burnout. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly can say that's the first time I've ever heard that. Um, burnout is burnout is yeah. that's when we want to like right lay on the ground right. and be like God why and we want to binge Netflix not like binge Jesus right we don't want to like go to our Bible we want to go to yeah. anything else yeah how on earth how on earth did you get to that point I mean like when we're listening to you talking, it's clear mm. it's clear that like you are a gifted communicator you have such a deep relationship mm -hmm. with God. But so often when we're in the wilderness, we're not looking for sunlight. We're yeah. looking for excuses, right? That's right. So just talk to us a little bit about that. How did you even get to starting something out of burnout? Well, it started with the right people around me. That is for sure. You know, and my husband being one of them, right? Um, what he didn't agree with my burnout. Right. And I think we live in a culture that loves to agree with our burnout. Yes, you're burned out. Yes, you're, you know, that is who you are. And yes, like, let's, let's cling on to everything that could coddle that. Now, this is not to say I'm against rest. I love rest. I love fun. I, I love all of that. And I'm a huge believer in rhythms of rest. However, my husband made sure that burnout was not my identity and it was not my destiny. That's great. Ooh. You know, and I feel like surrounding ourselves with the right people. I mean, when I, another point of burnout, I was talking to Chris. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and you know what Chris told me? And I love this. The, I love the fact that she was somebody that was so spirit filled, so spirit led that she was able to say this to me. She was like, uh, woman of God, get out of your cave. And, you know, that was her encouragement to me. She did not allow burnout to be my destiny. So having the Hang right on, I just want to interrupt and say yes. And there's a biblical precedent for that because the Lord said to Elijah, what are you doing in yes. this cave? So there you go. I felt that there was a, a biblical precedent for that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And actually, I don't know if you remember this, Chris, you were calling me Elijah for the next couple of months. You're like, Elijah. Oh, Get out of your cave. And it was so prophetic to me. It would really right. minister to me. And I think we need people around us to see uh, that burnout is not our destiny, that that's not our landing place. Sure, that's what our experience is. And we do not want to deny that. We do not want to reject that. However, um, if somebody just lets us 
set up camp there. Right. I think we need the kind of people that believe like fools and love with with such a fervor that they do not allow us to to stay there, remain there. Absolutely. Okay. So to the person that's listening and they find themselves with a passion that is brewing in them, you know, juxtaposed with lots of fears that go, I can't do this. Um, as we wrap up, what advice would you give to that person that goes, okay, I'm passionate, but I don't think I can do it. Yes. Oh my goodness. I would say pray until you can't help but do it. Pray until you just can't help it. Like it just, you just have to. It's interesting because the conversation of dreams is a very Western concept, actually. You know, when people wow. are like, believe in dreams, pursue your dreams. And for dreams to me sound very interesting because it sounds like, oh, it's a passion. It's a passion project, right? Um, dreams could also feel like a burden, right? Yes. It could feel yeah. like it's a necessity. I, I must do it until my bones are burning. Pray until you get there. I was so afraid of starting a conference for women in my region because I felt like I already knew the who the naysayers were going to be. I already knew what the the lashback is going to be. I, I already knew um, what the consequences will be, you know, and I was afraid. Let me tell you, the reason why I didn't want to throw one wasn't because I didn't think I could was because I was afraid of these things. And it took me five years. It took wow. me five years to be like, you know what? I don't even care anymore. You know, and that didn't happen until I burned out and binged on Jesus. And until he created in me what I did not have, which was a burning for these women to be activated and equipped. I, I, I prayed until I had to do it. And so instead of looking inward to find that courage in oneself, and I could totally be like, you know what, just force it, fake it till you make it. Sure. But that could also go only so far, you know, that could only go so far. You know, I just love that because ultimately our dependence is on God. And I could tell you just as a sister that is older in the faith, 35 mm -hmm. years on in mm -hmm. all of this, Yes, we implement and learn all the greatest principles and techniques and best practices. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it all comes back to Jesus. It all comes yeah. back to an utter dependence on him, on the yeah. presence of God, on the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm glad that even in our Propel Leadership podcast, we're bringing that back to front and center. Because a lot mm -hmm. of times as we become slicker in our leadership, we think we better relegate uh, prayer to the basement. And I want to bring it out of the basement and put it front and center of our leadership yes. unapologetically yes. and say, it's prayer and the presence of God that drives us. And then all of these other things we do, but if we are not sustained by God's presence, then in our darkest hours, and you know, we're not sugarcoating anything in our difficult times, our dark times, um, nothing else is going to sustain us but the presence of yeah. God. So thank you, Faith. You've been just such yes. a joy. I knew you would be. I love you to pieces. And this love has been you. an awesome conversation. I think it's built faith and confidence mm. and courage. And uh, as you were talking, I was just thinking, you know, when the Lord came to Moses and said to him, I've got this job for you, Moses was, but God, I can't do it. I'm not eloquent enough. I'm not. So I just want every listener to this to know none of us have ever felt qualified to do the thing that God has called us to do. In fact, yeah. if God has really called you to do it, you're not qualified. That's the whole point, That's that right. he is the one that gets the glory. There is nothing that I'm doing that I could do in my own natural strength. And I think yeah. that's the whole point of everything. It's a step of faith. And yeah. so Faith's details are listed and tagged in the description of this episode. So you can keep up with her and you need to. She's one of my favorite follows because she's hilarious from deeply spiritual things to crazy things with her children. So you really need to see that if you want to connect further. And I really want to encourage any of our Asian American sisters go to the mm. honor summit because I've, I've got several friends that are involved and they come back totally transformed. So for our listeners, we love each and every one of you. We appreciate you so much. And we thank you for joining us today on the Propel Women podcast. And we'll see you back here next week. Thank you so much for joining us today. Make sure to subscribe to this channel to get notified every time a new video is posted. We are so glad that you're here and look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.